Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I am Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with the sharp-eyed one, Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Good, Bruce. I just uh, I want to start out by apologizing to our listeners. I know that a lot of them wait up to listen to this, and they're probably expecting it some time ago. But I had to just as the game ended, or even before, I had to charge off to a hockey practice. Uh, the key, the team that I coach, and uh, so that's why we're a little bit late tonight. But um, let us come first. Practicing, but no games. Is that my understanding? Yeah, it's a little frustrating. We'll find out. Maybe there's going to be some games in. Um, April. I hope there is, Bruce. Uh, yeah. We'll see. All righty, Bruce. It was a very, uh, heck, we could have had the podcast after the second period. Because <laughs> uh, this game was over by then. 7-1. 7 one for the Oilers, Bruce. And the <laughs> outchance to uh, the Sens, 15-3. to three. Yeah. 15-3. to three. Wow. Three Sen- chances. Sens had more chances than that, but they kept missing the net when they did yeah. have a decent look. Like they had a few in the first period that I thought were dangerous, but every time they got a you know a close in look, they would fire wide. So, yeah, the Oilers really have but, that team's number. Well, they sure did tonight. That was a waxing. It was. That, they're gonna. They will be coming out hard uh, next game. You can be. You That's can be sure. Concern. But they, they are a little veteran talent-wise, Bruce. We've seen this team before. It was the Edmonton Oilers in about 2010-11. And it's got some young, talented hockey players. But it's missing um, that, that whole veteran core of really useful veteran hockey players is not there. But it's on the Oilers now. The Oilers have those veterans. Bruce, let's go uh, with two good things each. Um, we'll go with two bad things in total and two numbers in total. What's your first good thing? Yeah, I'm going to credit the defense pairing of uh, uh, Darnell Nurse and Tyson Barry. I thought they had a very strong game tonight. Uh, dominating play. They had uh, uh, one goal, one assist, two points, plus two for Nurse, three assists, plus three for Barry. And they were actually both on the ice for the goal against, which I guess we'll get to in a minute to take a little bit of the shine off of their stats, but it uh, wasn't just the stats. I mean, it was by eye. They looked good. Barry was make, creating all kinds of stuff and moving the puck well, and Darnell was just in command out there again. Man, it's 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 so nice to watch uh, how he's been playing uh, uh, this last little while. When they were on the ice at even strength tonight, which was about 16, 17 minutes uh, with... Uh, with Barry on the ice, the Oilers outshot the Senators nineteen to four, and they Ooh. just, you know, they just had, you know, they owned the puck, and it was uh, it was a clinic. So Tyson Barry's grown on me, Bruce. I have to mm-hmm. say, like he can really play hockey. It's just it's just interesting this whole issue on the right side of the defense with the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, I think most Oiler fans by now are expecting Barry won't be back. Right. And and they really like the other three defensemen and want them right. back more. I ran a poll today and that was the mm-hmm. result. But Tyson no Berry is he is coming on and he is a good hockey player. And uh, he could easily help them win some games. He's winning helping them win games in the regular season and he may help them in the playoffs because when the puck is on his stick, he is fantastic. Um during that great offensive rush, you know, that great minute long cycle that led mm-hmm. to the first goal, he made he he had a number of plays where it, yeah. he, he was making he took some tricky passes and he made some. He was absolutely integral to that whole movement and um, fantastic hockey player. Bruce, the thing is, uh, yeah, with Barry, ahead. this is the flip side. The Oilers were burned for three grade A scoring chances tonight, and we tabbed Barry as being <laughs> one of the responsible parties on all three of them. That is the flip side. That is it. He is the <laughs> stereotypical all offense, no defense hockey player, but. The, yeah. So, um, Bruce, my first good thing will be Leon Dreisaitl. Mm. And uh, he put on quite quite a show tonight. Um, his breakaway goal in the first period was, it, it, could, it might be on his career highlight reel. 
I mean, he, he doesn't like McDavid gets five, six goals like that every year. It's not quite as common with dry settle, but that was a beauty. And, uh, so that started off the, the greatness. We, we, um, in early in the second period, he almost scores again after a, a fantastic feed for McDavid. And what he just couldn't get it up. He, he couldn't get it oh. high enough. It was a great save, oh. but he couldn't get the puck high enough. Like, I think he he might have been a little up a little bit upset. Um, then he does get the power play goal. I'm just trying to think what was that. Oh, that's that's the incredible feed from Nugent Hopkins, mm-hmm. where Dry sidles at the side of the net and buries it. And um, what's the third goal? What happened there, Bruce? McDavid was... dropped the puck through his own legs, oh, yeah, through okay. the defenseman's legs, and it sort yeah. of showed up by Dry And he went, "Oh, there's the puck!" and boom, put it in the net. And he couldn't <laughs> believe the pass; like it just came. The puck like materialized right on his stick out of nowhere. <laughs> Ninety-seven had a pretty good game too. Actually, mm-hmm. he. Yeah, he <laughs> kept up. Connor McDavid, let me just check this, Bruce. He was in on 10 grade-A scoring chances, Connor McDavid, and uh, mm-hmm. Dreisaitl was in on um, 11. So those are, McDavid's usually in on about six, and Dreisaitl's usually in on about five per game. So this is a pretty special game for both of them. But uh, we are so lucky, Bruce. And um, to be, we're watching... Not just some great players now, but I think a pretty good team. And I and I think I've been consistently saying this all year, that this is a pretty good team. And um, it's just nice to see the results of the team start to match the great players, because then you can kind of really enjoy it rather than be frustrated by it on a pretty profound level. But we, we're starting to get in that 1980s groove, my friend, where it's just very, very enjoyable to watch this team many nights. And you know it's a good team. You know they're going to play well. You know all the pieces are there. It's just a matter of of them playing their game on a certain level. And they're not quite there yet. This is a team that can still still need some breaks, usually to win, uh, the breaks to go their way to win the game. But they're, they're, you know, they're getting more breaks uh, than the other team because they get more scoring chances, so. Oh, here's a random one. I just opened NHL.com, and this is worthy of mention on this podcast because we talked about this guy so much. Kings goalie wins first start in six years. Troy Grosnick allows one goal, facing 34 shots. Last played in the NHL in 2014. Good for you, Troy. Gotta like it. Gotta like it. Way to go, Troy Grosnick. I'm rooting for you now, buddy. And, and I was, and you know, kind of, well, I feel vindicated because I was bitching so excessively when the orders didn't, when the orders let him go. Mm-hmm. I, I think that they, the orders did see the better of the ways. Maybe they wanted, they always were thinking they could get someone a little bit better than him. And maybe they did, but good for him. Good for you, Troy Grosnick. All right, Bruce, your second good thing. Yeah, my second good thing is actually a whole bunch of good things rolled into one, which was uh, the uh, game-winning goal by uh, Jujar Kara off a fantastic play by uh, Devin Shore, who has really impressed me these last couple of games. I like his penalty killing. I like his intensity. And, uh, you know, he's, yeah. shown, he's shown me things that he he did in little spurts in his first, um, in his, in his first uh, trial, but uh, uh, he... he um, um, wasn't doing it very consistently, and who knows if he will. But these last couple of games, he's been very good. And this was a terrific play where Patrick Russell kind of hassled the guy coming out of his own end, and he made a bit of an errant pass, and Shore jumped on it, picked it off, and uh, uh, came in over the blue line. Meanwhile, over by the Vancouver bench, they were trying to create make a line change where two guys were doing the Keystone Cops routine. We would have had a lot of fun scoring that one if that had been no Oilers involved, where they basically took each other out of the play, allowing the Oilers a two-man and what might even have been a three-man breakaway uh, with uh, Shore and Kara joining the play, and they couldn't take Kara out because they they kind of lost their stuff there over by the bench. And uh, uh, Shore made a very nifty, convincing fake to the backhand, sort of made it look like, yeah, I'm going to take it myself and finish the job. And he took it to the backhand. He made a good fake first to kind of freeze the goalie. And then he pulled it back over and Kara just had to 
lifted over his pad and Kara uh, immediately turned. It was one of those goals where the goal scorer is immediately wants to congratulate the playmaker for making the goal. <laughs> he just turned yeah. and, and beamed at him. And in the meantime, this was the best part of the goal for me was Harna Ryan Singh doing the play-by-play. -play. Uh, uh, and uh, I've been saying all along, I want to watch a game where Harna Ryan calls a goal by Jujar Kara because uh, I knew it would be good, and it turned out it was a real good goal. Mostly it was sure, not Kara, but he did get the, the finishing touch. So that was uh, Harna Ryan Singh's uh, chance to uh, sing the praises of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of Jujar Kara, uh, which he did in delightful style. I, I have to, I have to come clean. By the way, uh, I've been feeling guilt for a long time. I ripped Harna Ryan Singh after he called a Johnny Goodrow goal in a Calgary game, and I, I was sour on a Saturday night, and I just didn't realize he was calling the game. I thought it was the Calgary Homers, you know. Well, and he, he, did, did, he Johnny did sound like Goodrow a Goodrow thing, right? But that's him, and he calls it both ways. He did the same thing for McDavid in a later game. And he did the same against Calgary. And he did it, you know, he just sort of, he's the Bonino, Bonino, Bonino guy. Every once in a while, you know, this is his his shtick, I guess, is that he will once in a while just, you know, go a little bit overboard on the goal call. And it's just a, more of a joyous thing than a, a rooting for any particular team thing. Well, I would bet he probably does root for Jujar Kara a little bit. So that was, that to me, that was delightful to hear and uh, to watch. And... Uh, Kara, my goodness, he uh, uh, he he looks like a man out there, doesn't he? Just hammering everybody. Six more hits tonight. Eleven and four on the face-off dot. Yeah. Just physically dominate. And they interviewed him at the end of the game, and he's he he may be the most hirsute man I've seen in a long time. With the <laughs> huge bushy beard, bushy eyebrows, and this gigantic uh, head of hair right now. And he. Uh, uh, he is, uh, uh, he's in full flower, let's put it that way. And he's been playing some pretty terrific hockey for the Edmonton Oilers. What a delight after it looked like he had one foot out the door in January. It really did. Yeah, I, I, uh, he, he has become a prototypical third line center, you know, solid defensively, chip in the odd goal. And be really tough, really physical. Kills I penalties. Know. I mean, what else do you mm -hmm. want from a third line center? Like, I, everyone said, there's all this talk. The others need a third line center. No, and maybe they need a second line, someone else to help as a second line center, like Eric Stahl. That would be fantastic. But they don't need a third line center. They have one, Jujar Carrot. And I and I like to have Hunter Ryan sing on the, because I could hear him say Kara like Kara <laughs> again and again and again. Yes. So I could start to hear get a sense of like how to try to say it. But and it is quite a subtle um, <laughs> Kara. Like he just there's a little H in there like like you were saying. Bruce, it, to be to you shouldn't beat yourself up too much about Singh in that Calgary game. I thought he was a homer too. I thought we were listening to the Calgary announcers. I thought it was Rick Ball. And was so and maybe that, this every Saturday? <laughs> maybe that is just is his shtick. He, he he does, but you know, he does a good job. Like you say, he's quite excited. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, tonight he was excited about our team, mm -hmm. so it it go it went over a lot better. Yeah, well, he did one think... like that for Goodrow in the 7-1, or for McDavid in the 7-1 win against Calgary when he scored that fantastic goal where yeah. he never looked at the net, and then he put it in, and he sort of embellished that goal call a little bit. And it's like I say, I don't think it's a bias thing. I just think it's a him It's, it's thing. his style. Yeah. Yeah, and as for Shore's move, I mean, every now right. and then, Devin Shore makes a move that, like, it's, like, absolutely <laughs> screaming with skill. Mm -hmm. And it kind of surprises you. He scored a goal earlier this year against Toronto where he just actually, you know, went in on a breakaway and ripped it off the post. It's like, wow, yeah, who is the this Habs, guy? A shorty, yeah. Was it, yeah. Yep. Was it against the Habs? Yeah. It's he's, he's like that, you know, Murray Wilson, you know, like uh, from the Habs in the 70s. Like, you don't see a lot from him. And all of a sudden, he rips down the wing and hammers in a beautiful shot. So, hey, good for the orders. This kind of plays into my second good thing, Bruce, which is Dave's Tippett's handling of the team. And, uh, you know, of course, I've been critical of Tippett now and then, as I am of every Oilers coach. Um, but, Bruce, I really want to give him credit. Like, huh? he has, I think he has a, a, a skill for finding the right role for players, defining that role, working with them, and, and 
and being true to the player, giving like letting them do that role, giving them like if you're the penalty killer, you're out there every time, and this is your role, this is what you're doing. And I saw tonight a team that was everyone bought into their role, everyone was doing their their thing, their particular thing, and mm-hmm. he's slowly, you know, perhaps because there was no preseason this year. There wasn't one functional line at the start of the season for the Edmonton Oilers, as far as I'm concerned. There wasn't one line that had any chemistry. And he has slowly has built that up. Kind of fell apart against the Toronto Maple Leafs, but he slowly mm-hmm. built that up where there's been one line going, then two lines. And tonight, I think we probably saw all four lines going. The top line, you know, he, he needed to make some move. And I, I'm happy with the move that he made. I think Yamamoto is is a just an excellent fit in the end for those two players. He can be he can be their Tikkanen, and you know the guy the glue player who fills in, covers for a lot of mistakes on defense, which happened now and then with that group of players. If I'm completely honest, but it wasn't just it's not just the top line. I mean the 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 Haas line is quite a good line. Um, they got a goal. The the Kara line is a very good line. Um, it has been the last couple games. I mean, it is against the Ottawa Senators, so that's the proviso. And we'll see. You know, I'm still not convinced about the Nuge line, if I'm completely honest, but uh, they had a good game tonight as well. So, Well, Cowher's line is not even his regular line. I mean, he was playing yeah. with Ennis and Archibald and, and when, you know, he really turned his game around. And now all of a sudden Ennis is on a different line and Archibald's been unavailable for a few games. And uh, uh, so he had uh, uh, tonight Patrick Russell and Devin Shore. I mean, that's not exactly, uh, you know, superstars. They're they're basically (laughs) entry-level players, right? Right on the cusp of the NHL. Yeah, replacement-level players, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, and the line was still effective, so... uh, so give Jujar credit for some of that. Man, he made a good play in the corner tonight where he, where he won a battle against against two guys, outfought a third guy and drilled a centering pass across. And who was oh, it? Yeah. Neil, Neil couldn't quite handle the pass. Yeah. And by the time he got it under control, like he got a close-in shot, but Murray had time to react. And the pass maybe could have been a six inches closer to Neil. Well, that was a great play, very persistent play by Kara in the corner, and he ripped the puck into the danger zone, and danger ensued. Tippett's defensive groupings are also, you know, Ethan Bear's coming on. He's he seems to be rebounding and finding his game. He looked to me more like like his old self tonight, which was great to see. Chris Russell is playing fantastic right now. If I'm completely honest, like I know, you know, of course, like all Oilers players, he has his critics. He's really. I thought he was a step slow burst at the start of the year, maybe even lost a step. But he's flying out there. You know, he's benefiting, I think, from playing on the left side um, yes. every game and not having to go over to the right side. Like it's it's a, that's a. I think it's a big burden and it wears him down and he gets physically pounded somewhat too because he's in prone positions moving the puck on his backhand. But he's skating. If you can skate like Chris Russell, you can have a long career in the NHL, and he's having that. And I give him a lot of credit. So, so um, yeah, everything seems to be in sync right now with the Edmonton Oilers, and there's the revamped Mike Smith um, in that, and see how I love goes. Mike Smith's game tonight. And when you think, yeah. well, he only had three high-danger chances against them. One of them went in, and one of them hit the post. Well, what is there to love? Well, uh, he, he, he was just totally engaged in the game. He was snapping up pucks. He was... Uh, he, you know, I mean, the one goal, he had no chance. It was just, you know, that was a, a tremendous pass and, you know, tap in. Uh, but I particularly loved his puck handling. And I was watching that, and he made one strong play after the other. And, man, can he rip the puck, not only on his forehand, but his backhand. Like, he went, once he went out behind the net and uh, fielded the puck and then shot it behind him, and it was so hard. He ripped it around the board so hard that the guy at the point couldn't get over there. I would I wouldn't have given that that shot a a, a five percent chance of clearing the zone. And you know you see, say Chris Russell try and backhand that shot around the boards and out of the zone. It ain't going to get out like ever. But Smith has such power on both sides of the stick. And and tonight, at least, and most nights this year, he picked his spots. Uh, uh, he picked his spots well. 
And uh, he's, you know, he's putting up the numbers. He is he's, putting up the numbers. He he's is, found the uh, fountain of youth. Let's see if I can find him here. He won't be too it's far down the list. Yeah, he's about 927 now. Uh, eight wins, two losses. Uh, 927 save percentage, 2.18 goals against average, and we're now halfway through the season. So, I mean, this this sense of foreboding that that folks had when the Oilers signed him that he would, you know, and it may yet be coming, but to this point, he's been, you know, I mean, to say satisfactory is a huge understatement. He's been excellent. Let's just say it. Everyone was wrong. Like almost everyone was against that signing. Like some people were more critical than other others, but you know, you know, you you tried to th- think it through and and uh, be a little calmer than most, Bruce. But most people were against it, and every, everyone was wrong. He's proving everybody wrong. So good for you, Mike Smith. Bruce, what's your bad thing? Uh, I'm going to give the orders a pass tonight, and I'm going to give my sympathies to the Ottawa Senators. What a bad, tough, difficult, no good night it was for them. To come out and get, you know, just overwhelmed like that early, and you could sit. They panned the bench when it was four nothing, and there was like forty five minutes to play, and they just looked like, here we go again. Yeah. And if it was just that, I wouldn't feel that sorry for them. But there was two what looked like serious injuries, to yeah. a pair of senators who crashed into the end board. <sighs> yeah. Uh, first it was uh, Colin White, and then it was Ryan Zingle, and both of them. Uh, went down the tunnel, not putting any weight on either legs, and I would not be at all shocked if they turn out to be long-term injuries. In fact, the biggest shock would be if neither of them were long-term injuries. I bet at least one of those guys has gone for a while, and maybe both. That was uh, that's tough to watch. I hate injuries. I hate them on either side, and you know, and it was just I don't think there was any sort of malice of forethought. It was guys going in hard on the puck, and you know, the Senators they do play hard. I I, I give them credit. But uh, they uh, went hard and it went awry, and it was just symbolic of their night that two guys took a header or footer into the uh, uh, into the end boards and banged up. Looked like knee injuries or maybe ankles, but not good. So, yeah, and the poor coach, his hundredth NHL game, and he gets to enjoy a seven-one loss with the too many men on the ice penalty. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't worth enjoy it. Enjoy your milestone make, game, coach, and that uh, that brutal line change where they gave up the two man breakaway. Like it was, it was not a good night for uh, Ottawa Senators. So they're my bad thing. But the injuries, but they're, the injuries are my real bad thing. That's, yeah, that sucks, I, sucks, I, sucks. I I felt the same way about those injuries. Though, if if I'm completely honest, Bruce, and maybe this doesn't speak well of me. When there's players that I h- hate on the other team and they get injured, like especially if they're dirty players. I like it, so I'm going to admit that right now. When 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 the owners have played teams when they're up against really dirty guys, if they get hurt. I'm okay with that. So there you go. Uh, my bad thing, Bruce, was Mike Smith um, losing a shutout. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of some. I'm going to say lackadaisical defending by the pretty much everyone on the ice by the top group of players. Um, they all just seem to be coasting just a little bit on that play, I'm going to say. Nurse and Barry, perhaps, in particular. So and yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but they, they're protecting a shutout, right? It's a shutout. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's for your goalie. He, he's he, he's your goalie. He's earned this. He's going mm-hmm. for something that's kind of important to him. So um, that's my bad thing. I'm not going to, you know, I guess I did name a couple of players there, but it was a fairly big, it was a group effort on that one. And um, they allowed Ottawa to get that goal. So it was a great pass. Like it was, it looked like almost a nothing play until that guy made that killer pass across the, the slot to Dadanoff, who scored again against the Oilers third game in a row. There were some open players on that play, Bruce, is what I'm going to yeah. say. Some, okay. some kind of open guys. Um, anyway, well, that was the first. I'm gonna. This isn't my numbers, but I'm gonna cheat and slide some numbers in because it's on topic to your point about this. This was the first goal against all year, five on five, where both Connor McDavid and Leon Drysaddle were on the ice. They've now played after tonight's game 
88 minutes and 46 seconds together, so an hour and a half. And in that time, the Oilers have outshot the other team 69-34, and they've outscored the other team, wait for it, 14 to 1! <laughs> With McDavid and Drysaddle on the ice in like a game and a half. 14 to 1! So it, has, it was 14 to 0, and now they've gone and wrecked it, you know, so bad thing. There you go. <laughs> yeah, they're uh, shutting up the critics who uh, were complaining about wow. playing together last year, including me. Um, Bruce, uh, what what is your number? Uh, I'm going to go with the number 25 tonight. And that is, by my count, the number of passes in, cons- in succession that led to the first Oilers goal uh, by Darnell Nurse. And it started, the first pass was made by none other than Mike Smith from behind his own net, 200 feet from where the puck would eventually wind up. And Smith touched the puck uh, with 17.08 on the clock, and it eventually went into the Ottawa net with 16.08 on the clock, a full minute later. And the Oilers had possession the whole time, with a couple of exceptions where it was kind of, it kind of took a bounce and it went to another Oiler in the corner where it was, I mean, it worked out as if it was a completed pass. 25 passes, and it was like Barry, Barry to Nurse to Drysaddle to McDavid to, to Yamamoto, and they had the puck on the string. I, I called it, I commented on Twitter, and I called it uh, uh, Tiki Taka hockey. You know, that's, that's the uh, style of soccer famously played by Barcelona. And all the years when... Uh, uh, I used to watch Champion, uh, Champions League. And I, I'm a Barcelona fan, and when they scored, I'd go back and I'd count how many passes there were in the build-up to the goal. You know, and it might be 25 or 20, or I remember 37 one time. But yeah. I mean, 25 passes in hockey, and it wasn't a power play, right? It wasn't like that, okay, they got the puck on the power play and they're just you know swinging it around the perimeter. This was like. Uh, five guys that are better than the other five guys and they just got the puck all the time just an incredible full one minute sequence of edmonton having the puck and, and it, the last 50 seconds were in ottawa's end it took them four passes to get out and and get get through the neutral zone and in and then it was you might as well have played the calliope music you know that <laughs> That was like Team Canada 87 passing. Like, it was just amazing. Amazing like movement of the USSR. Puck. Yeah, Red Army. I don't know. Yeah. Give, give them ding, the ding, credit ding, ding, they ding, ding, deserve. Ding. You know, and, and <laughs> possession in hockey is so much more fragile than possession in, in soccer. It's Absolutely. more like it's more like possession. If you could do that in soccer, like in, like in the, it, what's it called, the 18-yard box? Like, mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's possession is pretty fragile in the eighteen yard box in soccer. But if if it was like in that kind of goal scoring area, that would be the equivalent of what the Oilers did there because it was an amazing display of skill, reading the play, moving your feet. What a what a fantastic thing that was to watch. It was I could I'm gonna probably go watch that again. Maybe watch it. Uh, the only, the only downside was there was maybe three or four of the passes that were. Uh, that were to the backhand side of the receiver, so he had to turn and accept. So they couldn't like flow it towards, channel it towards the net as quickly as he would like. But they, you know, they they would turn and deal with it, and then they maybe have to swing it back out. But just just a constant pressure. And by the end of it, the Senators' defenders and probably the goalie as well were dead tired and probably a little bit dazed and confused, if not dizzy, from all of the. I can I can think of one other downside, and it's not it's more of an aesthetic downside. It's mm-hmm. that the, the goal that resulted from it wasn't yeah. a beauty. Like it would have been nice. It was the the goal re- re- rewarded there all that skill and great hard work, but it would have been nice to finish that off with a with a slam grand dunk. slam, yeah, slam dunk. And and that's my number, Bruce. It's it's eight, and mm-hmm. those were kind of the um, slam dunk shots. I call them five alarm uh, scoring chances. Mm-hmm. These are these are chances that are you know a grade A chance according to us is about twenty five percent chance of going in. Well, the five alarm chances are thirty three percent plus, and I I saw the orders with eight of them tonight. So that includes Kara's goal, um, Patrick uh, Patrick Russell's shot from McDavid's feed in the in the first period, Drysidle's breakaway, Drysidle's power play shot early in the second period that the with, with the with the great save. Nugent Hopkins' slot shot that came soon after that off the McDavid feed. 
mm-hmm. which was a bang bang play in the slot. Dreisaitl's uh, power play goal off the incredible feed from Nugent Hopkins. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dreisaitl's goal from the McDavid feed and Yamamoto's shot off the Dreisaitl feed. So there, there was eight just incredible scoring chances. Um, you know, they're, they're probably 40 to 50% um, of the time those, those kinds of shots are going to go in. But um, for some of those ones. But just to, that four. was the most skill we've seen from the Oilers uh, all year long. Four out of the eight did go in, right? Four out of the eight. 50%. Percent. Yeah, yeah, there you go. About, seems about appropriate. Now, I mean, Murray made a couple of 10-bell saves out in there. Yeah, yeah. All righty, Bruce. Well, we should get this posted. Uh, I should mm-hmm. get this posted. Post, what is is there a word called post haste? What does that mean? Post haste means as soon as possible, basically. Okay. Well, there you go. I should get this posted post haste, and I will. Hmm. So um, let's leave it there. We'll, we'll talk again, I guess, on Friday night. Thanks for talking tonight. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime... And in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.